Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Sweet Success Training Module. Today, we will be talking about self-efficacy and patient empowerment in diabetes and pregnancy. My name is Samantha Markovitz. I am a national board-certified health and wellness coach and supervisor of health and wellness initiatives at the Mary and Dick Allen Diabetes Center at Hoke Hospital in Newport Beach, California. I am excited to have the opportunity to talk about these very important topics with you today. We'll be reviewing the transformational shift taking place in how we look at models of patient care, like the patient empowerment philosophy of diabetes care versus traditional compliance-oriented care. We'll also discuss tools available to providers that can help build strong foundations for patient empowerment and self-efficacy while also defining a patient's role in the context of these goals. Additionally, we'll address the foundations of empowerment and self-efficacy through the lens of the patient's ability to make choices for herself within a trusting patient-provider relationship and reviewing the benefits of a constructive relationship between the patient and healthcare establishment. Achieving goals and improving outcomes. How can we do it? And what does it have to do with the way we think about empowerment and self-efficacy in our patients with diabetes and pregnancy? Self-care, which in the context of the studies referenced in this presentation, is often interchangeable with self-management, which is a central component of treatment for diabetes and pregnancy. And this means patient empowerment isn't a nice to have, but a true necessity for patient success. Patients who feel capable of managing their diabetes and pregnancy are empowered to take care of themselves and their baby. They can work with their providers and rely on themselves between appointments. They're able to do what it takes to get the clinical results that point to the best possible outcomes while also thriving through a lens of overall health and well being. The nature of the patient-provider relationship has evolved over time. In the last several years, we've seen provider frustrations rise as their time with patients is squeezed by other demands. Patients may leave appointments with more questions than they arrived with and feel the frustration of not knowing how to move forward after leaving the office. And at the same time, technology began to enable forward-thinking practices uh, to send messages between appointments and in some cases facilitate telehealth visits. Reimbursement looked to be a hurdle for this uh, type of option with widespread adoption. And then came COVID. Suddenly we had little choice. If we want to be there for our patients, if we want to keep patient volume up, the doors open and the lights on, it became clear that this was to be the way forward. And at the same time, We've seen a shift in the conversation around psychosocial care and support, particularly for people living with chronic illness. We know that the health of the mind and body are intertwined. We have to pay attention to both if we want to see the best clinical results and quality of life in our patients. Now think about all of that, but then with the layer of pandemic-related pressures that arose over the past year, the additional pressures of the COVID-related economic crisis and lack of childcare largely fell on the shoulders of women. While we're thinking about women being diagnosed with gestational diabetes or working towards a healthy pregnancy with pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes, they're not just dealing with that singular challenge. They're not even just dealing with diabetes and pregnancy and life's regular day-to-day -day challenges, but truly unprecedented issues that require not just patients and creative problem solving, but also a truly holistic approach to their well being. And certainly, it would be enough to stress anyone to be told that they need to tightly manage their blood glucose levels and do all of the things that we ask of patients in these scenarios. They need care at regular intervals, often from a whole team of specialists, plus regular lab work. Then we also ask them to adhere to a series of regimented self-care behaviors and frequently remind them of the potential consequences of inattention or even the things that can happen that come up outside of their control, no matter how hard they work at this. This may be a tighter version of control than they're already used to, or it may be a completely new diagnosis of gestational diabetes and a new way of living. 
And with that in mind, we want to help set our patients up for success. We know that a strong social support network is associated with successful implementation of these self-care behaviors. We know that an individual's confidence in their ability to carry out these self-care behaviors is associated with successful implementation. And we know that one's attitude towards the things they are being tasked with in the management of their diabetes and pregnancy is associated with successful self-care behaviors in these patients. So we are looking at how to strengthen these areas because we know how important their impact on the outcomes can be. The reality of diabetes and pregnancy. A diabetes diagnosis or the type of treatment necessary to aim towards positive outcomes in pregnancy is different than most other diseases. This is not a situation where a patient gets the diagnosis, takes a pill at breakfast every day, and doesn't think about it again until their next appointment. This is truly an all-day, all-night condition that requires constant attention and focus and still has no guarantees of smooth sailing, no matter how hard someone works at it. The patient is doing all of this on her own. She has to self-motivate and find the energy, resources, and ability to handle these vitally important tasks. There's the anxiety of feeling that if she were to, quote, get this wrong, something horrible could happen and that weighs heavily on many patients. Then, on top of these concerns is diabetes and pregnancy. There's still real life to contend with, work inside or outside of the home, caregiving to other children or family members, financial concerns, et cetera. The patient has to figure out how to handle it all and with truly very little institutional support. And on the subject of medical support, let's think about what that might look like for our patients by comparing the traditional model of care with the patient empowerment model. Generally, our system is built in a way where interactions are typically brief and far between. Traditional patient care doesn't serve folks with diabetes or chronic illness particularly well, but especially so during the season of life where the patient is either managing pre-existing diabetes with pregnancy or is newly diagnosed with gestational diabetes during pregnancy. These patients need more support, not less. In our system, we don't always have the flexibility or autonomy to make appointments longer or more frequent. What we can do is make each interaction as impactful as possible. We may not be in a place where we can shed the traditional model, but we can shift our approach to empower our patients and support their understanding of their role and how they can make progress for themselves. Patients are the experts in their own body and experience, and providers bring the medical expertise and experience to support that. Providers can help patients have a more active experience, providing knowledge and teaching skills to help patients engage productively during their limited interactions with providers. As a result, patients may gain greater control over decision-making and action-taking to improve outcomes for themselves and baby, while also improving their overall well-being and strengthening their ability to take care of themselves and their family going forward. So taking a deeper dive into the conceptual model of patient empowerment, you can take a look here on the slide. This visual is based on a study done with Britain's National Health Service and takes a decidedly more European perspective on healthcare. However, the model could be universal as a more equitable and collaborative model of healthcare delivery, noted for the potential to improve cost effectiveness of care, especially for people affected by chronic conditions like diabetes. I've simplified the main points made here on the next slide. It's worth noting that there are multiple definitions of patient empowerment. It's not necessarily a destination, but a transformative process that patients go through as they gain control of their health and health care and adapt to having a chronic disease. It may also focus on principles of patient empowerment like autonomy and self-determination. Definitions of patient empowerment also vary in how they focus on patients, healthcare providers, and or the healthcare system. The patient has the right responsibilities and opportunities to their autonomy, self-determination, retaining power within the healthcare relationship, and optimizing their ongoing healthcare. The provider has the responsibility of respecting the patient's autonomy 
and adopting a partnership approach within the healthcare relationship. Some of the ways this can be achieved include focusing on empowering the individual during interventions, putting the emphasis on shared decision-making, utilizing motivational interviewing as a tool, which we'll talk more about shortly, as well as potentially utilizing national board certified health and wellness coaches to assist in the process and support the patient in these specialized behavior changes. It's important to acknowledge that how the provider adopts this approach will be unique to their own training, personal values and characteristics, and how they perceive their own professional goals. And then the healthcare system also plays a role as it has the responsibility of optimizing service and maximizing patient's health status and well-being. The approach that a healthcare system might take here can truly vary based on local and federal regulation, culture, funding, and staff bandwidth, which we won't be focusing as much on today. So pulling back a little bit here, what benchmarks should providers be looking to reach within this approach? We're looking for things like self-efficacy by way of the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and self-awareness on the part of the patient to influence their own health behaviors but also their perceived personal control over their own health and healthcare, a sense of meaning and coherence about their condition, health literacy, and perhaps a sense of respect for the patient by the provider. This will vary based on patient personal characteristics and values, their own illness-related circumstances, and their ability to draw on social support. We're looking to encourage these types of behaviors from patients as a result of this approach things like active participation in shared decision-making, making informed decisions about their health care, active diabetes self-management, choosing personally meaningful and realistic health-related goals in collaboration with you as their provider, taking these independent steps on their own at home to achieve those goals, self-empowerment activities, like choosing to participate in patient support or advocacy groups, and using the internet to collect and or share health information and support. And this one has a bit of a caveat, which is that we want to encourage patients to seek out accurate, up-to-date, evidence-based information and support, not just anything that can be found on the internet. So how do we know if we're meeting the mark with this approach? We're looking for patient outcomes that are positive and show an adaptation to life with diabetes, a high perceived and actual quality of life, a sense of well-being and satisfaction within their life, and a feeling of independence. The research supports that this also leads to improved clinical outcomes. So in the case of diabetes, we're also looking for those additional markers of success, including commonly thought of metrics like in-range blood sugars, a healthy birth weight for baby, and so on. So we have to think to ourselves, why does this matter? And with diabetes management falling squarely on the shoulders of the patient, it's vital that they are clear on what they need to do to care for themselves. Having the knowledge and understanding of what has to happen is one thing, but having the conviction within themselves that they're able to follow their treatment plan to reach a positive outcome is the second piece of that puzzle. Self-efficacy is essential for this adherence to be achieved. And what happens when we start to see successful results from our efforts? we're bolstered, the efforts feel validated, and we grow our confidence. And there's that empowerment coming into play. The self-efficacy is the gateway to the empowerment. Okay, we've established that. But what can we do as providers and professionals who care for and about women experiencing diabetes and pregnancy to help make this happen? Well, we have to work within the system we have at this time. We may not be able to spend more time with patients or see them more frequently, and we certainly can't come into their homes on a regular basis to manage their diabetes for them. Just like our patients, we have to use what we have and think creatively in order to reach our goals and in turn help our patients reach theirs. We're going to take a look at how a fresh perspective and a varied toolbox can help us to encourage that patient empowerment and self-efficacy in our patients. So on this slide, you'll see an overview of the tools you can keep in mind to support your patients in their journey of empowerment and self-efficacy with diabetes and pregnancy. At the most basic, 
you can take a step back and think about the human piece of this experience. With your professional experience working with this population, you have the ability to potentially anticipate patient needs and build them into your process. And doing this can help prevent the rumination and catastrophizing that many providers observe in their patients. A quick example of this is working with your team to prevent what some might call a diagnosis by default, uh, which can be a common cause of this stress and anxiety for patients. Imagine this scenario. A patient comes in at 28 weeks for their glucose test and then later receives a MyChart lab result that indicates a gestational diabetes diagnosis with no further information or context. That patient has to either wait until their next appointment or reach out to the office to find out more. That's probably a place where a small tweak could prevent distress for the patient and the need for the office to respond to their perhaps panicked inquiries. In most cases, that's something that can be avoided simply by thinking about an area where you've seen patients have difficulties in the past and in anticipation of that situation, that can be addressed proactively. In addition to the idea of utilizing past experience to think proactively about better serving our patients, we have these other tools at our disposal. Integrating the transtheoretical model of behavior change by assessing the patient's readiness to act on a new, healthier behavior by using the stages of change as a means to guide the process building rapport and eliciting behavior change with motivational interviewing, empowering patients with personalized evidence-based health education, affirming patients' efforts, preparing to provide resources and referrals where they're needed and or supportive to the patient, and exploring casual or formal partnerships with professionals who can help your patients accomplish the goals you've helped them set on their journey with diabetes and pregnancy. So as we talked about at the beginning of that slide, the trans-theoretical model of behavior change, also known as the stages of change model, establishes six stages of change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and termination. Maintenance and termination are less commonly discussed and oftentimes more focus is placed on those first four steps of pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, and action. In a traditional healthcare setting where we're pressed for time, we may not have the time or training to walk patients through the kinds of discussions that fully assess and encourage progress through the stages of change. However, this can still be a helpful tool as a provider because it's a framework for understanding where your patient is on their journey and how you can speak educate and guide that patient in a way that will be most impactful for them in that moment. An easy way to use motivational interviewing is to ask the patient on a scale of 1 to 10 how likely they are to make a health behavior change they're considering. After they answer, you can follow up with the question, what might move you closer to a 10? Together, you can discuss how that might happen. For example, if the patient is considering adding a walk after breakfast to mitigate a morning post-meal spike, they may be expressing ambivalence about that change. You would follow up on that ambivalence by asking, on a scale of one to 10, how likely do you feel it, it is that you're going to add that post-breakfast walk to your routine? Or on a scale of one to 10, how ready do you feel to make this change? Perhaps the patient answers that they feel about a six. Your follow-up might look like, and what might help you move closer to a 10? And then you can address with them how to overcome that obstacle to get closer to taking action on what you've just discussed. Scaling questions like these can help patients become more internally motivated to make the behavior change that they've been considering. And this is a perfect transition into discussing an effective key in unlocking discussions about the stages of change. Our next tool on the list, motivational interviewing. I love what Susan Dopart says in her previous MI training for the Sweet Success Program. She introduces the concept of motivational interviewing as how to talk so patients will listen and how to listen so patients will talk. That's a really simple and straightforward way to think about the use of motivational interviewing in the healthcare setting. Motivational interviewing is a discussion strategy or counseling approach uh, that 
elicit behavior change by assisting patients to explore and resolve their ambivalence about moving through the stages of change. As we discuss the themes of patient empowerment and self-efficacy throughout this module, we can acknowledge here that empowerment is a major principle in motivational interviewing. When a patient has gestational diabetes or is pregnant with existing diabetes, we are giving knowledge, support, and tools for life, not just for these nine months. Sure, the guidelines around diabetes and pregnancy can be intense, and the stakes are highest during pregnancy, but the skills and habits that patients have the potential to build during this time can lead to healthy lifestyle modification for their whole family. It can lead to improved diabetes management or reducing risk factors for diabetes and or diabetes complications for a lifetime. Motivational interviewing is less a specialized technique as it is an energy, or as it's often referred to as the spirit of MI. Some of the ways that you can utilize this in your patient appointments include asking open-ended questions, listening reflectively, summarizing statements back to your patients, using affirmation and validation, uncovering and addressing ambivalence, supporting patients with optimism, enthusiasm, and expressing empathy. The bottom line is that motivational interviewing creates lasting change because it is self-guided, focused on one's own autonomy, understanding, and intentions. Education. This is key for people who work in this field and interface with patients at risk for or diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Women coming into pregnancy with pre-existing diabetes still need guidance and education, but they are, in the majority of cases, coming in with extensive knowledge and experience of their own diabetes, whereas women diagnosed with gestational diabetes in pregnancy may have a very limited familiarity with diabetes or diabetes in pregnancy. When you see patients with gestational diabetes all of the time, this information starts to seem basic, but this is still a landmark event for the patient. It can be helpful to be clear with the patient upfront about the procedures and processes from screening through delivery. Time these conversations appropriately and use language that the patient can understand. And we'll talk a little bit more about health literacy further on in the presentation. You can use your past experience caring for women with gestational diabetes to tailor your approach. An example of this is when a patient asks, why did this happen? The silent question often behind that statement is, what did I do to cause this? If the patient is stuck in this stigmatized, guilt-driven state of mind, they'll be unable to move forward productively. So think about what can you do to head that off right from the start? We can help by not leaving them to wonder wherever we can avoid it, and that starts with proactive education. You are already aware of what the common misconceptions, fears, and questions are, so you are well positioned to meet the patient where they are before those misconceptions, fears, and questions become true stumbling blocks for them. Affirmations. The high-risk part of diabetes and pregnancy is a big deal. It's important that women are informed about these potential issues and the vital importance of managing blood glucose as close to normal as possible, or whatever their doctor feels is appropriate for their individual situation. However, once that's been established, there has to be a fine line between being matter-of-fact about the reality of the situation and how to have hope and believe in your ability to do what it takes move forward safely. And one way to do this is to embrace the power of affirmation. So there's two types of affirmation we want to consider here. The first is self-affirmation by the patient to themselves. The second is affirmation from the provider to the patient. Research has shown that patients who are affirmed and receive encouraging messages about their health are more likely to follow through on behavior change. When patients get to the point where they're in the habit of self-affirmation, they are less defensive and communicate more openly with providers, resulting in more positive healthcare experiences. Patients who have a limited support network or have lifestyles that have to change substantially in order to adhere to the treatment plan 
are a couple groups that can particularly benefit from these encouraging messages from providers, as well as the practice of self-affirmation. Affirmation can encourage existing intrinsic motivation and also be helpful to patients who struggle to overcome the barriers to their intrinsic motivation. Resources and referrals. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about a couple practical tools at your disposal to encourage patient empowerment and self-efficacy. So why resources and referrals? Well, you are already in your zone of genius in your area of expertise. You cannot be all things to all of your patients. And at the same time, your patients may need more support than what you're able to provide. In a vacuum of information and support, they're susceptible to bad information. And you're a specialist and your patients trust you. However, you can't and shouldn't have to be all things to all of your patients. It's not within your scope or the interest of time to try to cover everything, but that doesn't mean that your patient couldn't use some extra support. One effort you or your staff can make to mitigate this is to keep a referral list of professionals that you feel are knowledgeable and aligned with the message that you are working to get across to your patients. You may also choose to keep a list of books, websites, podcasts, or other such resources to share either proactively or upon request. Since you and your patient have established trust or are in the process of actively working towards that, they'll be looking to you in your office to figure out where to go for more information or support. Keeping prepared options on hand saves time for you because you likely get asked these questions frequently, and now you have the information ready for the next time it comes up. It also saves time for your patient because they're being handed a vetted, up-to-date, evidence-based resource or referral from someone they can trust. If necessary, they can call their insurance with the name that you've provided to confirm coverage without having to guess who they should consult. So partnering, this is a bit of a follow-up to the referral piece on the last slide, but it's also another way that you can empower your patient and increase the likelihood of adherence to self-management and self-care routines. So partnering, partnering with other professionals who have the knowledge and skill sets that are complementary to yours can be very helpful for both your practice and for your patient's uh, self-management process. We tell our patients they don't have to do this alone. And as providers and allied health professionals, we don't have to do this alone either. Let's lean on each other to provide that wraparound care and support for our patients. This type of team approach allows patients to feel taken care of, listened to, and empowered, while care teams know that together, we're able to deliver the experience that makes those positive patient outcomes possible. Most of you probably do this pretty frequently without giving it any thought when you have your patients consult registered dietitians for guidance on how to eat for diabetes and pregnancy. Expanding on this idea, Maybe you know of some local or distance fitness instructors or personal trainers who specialize in prenatal or high-risk patients that can help support your patients on their physical activity efforts during pregnancy. Maternal mental health is an important place to find partners to benefit your patient's health and well-being as well. Think about who you trust, who has the knowledge and skills to support a woman newly diagnosed with diabetes during pregnancy or undergoing pressure because of the additional challenges of pregnancy due to pre-existing diabetes. Another type of professional you may want to explore as a referral or additional in-office resource for your patients is the National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach. National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coaches are experts in behavior change. They can be a huge asset to your patients with their ability to walk alongside and support these women during a most challenging time that requires their full attention and commitment to living within rigid guidelines for their own health and the health of their baby. A patient who has the tools and wraparound support is 10 steps ahead of a patient who's been told they have diabetes and sent on their way. The way we utilize these strategies can make the difference for these women. Of course, there are extenuating factors that can make this more challenging, and it's our responsibility to do the best we can to mitigate those factors within our control. Before we get into that, 
let's take a moment to look at a case study. We frequently center our focus around patients with the highest risk or probability of a gestational diabetes diagnosis, but we know that there are plenty of women diagnosed with gestational diabetes that don't present with the typical profile, and yet their oral glucose test reveals the issue. In the case of this patient, her only risk factor is age. Knowing quite little about gestational diabetes, like so many patients prior to their diagnosis, this patient wasn't concerned about taking an oral glucose challenge since she didn't think she was really at risk. When the one hour glucose challenge returned an elevated number, she came back for the three hour oral glucose tolerance test, even though she admits she was convinced the number was an anomaly. As it turns out, the three hour test returned out of range numbers. Late on a Friday afternoon, she received a message in her patient portal with the lab results and a vague reference about discussing gestational diabetes with her doctor at her next scheduled appointment, which was two weeks from then. Put yourself in the shoes of this patient. No family history, not overweight, only risk factor is age, has little knowledge of gestational diabetes, and only knows what she sees in the media about generalized diabetes and has internalized messages of diabetes that may not be accurate. She gets this message and can't get a hold of anyone from her doctor's office until Monday. She was partially in denial about the situation and also panicking about what this means for her and her baby. At first, we see her in denial. She doesn't understand the diagnosis or how it could happen to someone like her. She might have called her doctor's office, but now it's 5 p.m. on a Friday. So instead, she starts Googling and quickly gets concerned about the potential negative outcomes. She simply doesn't know what to think. Looking at where a different course of events could have helped empower this patient, there are a few highlights that come to mind in the short snapshot of this patient's experience. At any point in her care, her doctor might have explained why the glucose challenge occurs. When she was sent to do the three-hour test, it might have been helpful to provide additional education about the purpose of that follow-up. If the results had to be sent via message, the message could have provided a short explanation of what it means and how to proceed until she has the opportunity to speak with her doctor. If possible, the results could have been delivered over the phone to give the patient the opportunity to ask questions and put her mind at ease a little bit. The recommendation of a book or a website could have been helpful to get the patient feeling knowledgeable prior to her upcoming doctor's appointment. These are just a few examples of small tweaks to the process that could have been impactful for this woman instead of kicking off her journey with diabetes and pregnancy with fear and confusion, which we would like to avoid. Meeting the need. There are challenges of all kinds that put up barriers to the empowerment and self-efficacy we are looking to foster in our patients. We need to be intentional about meeting the needs of our communities, and we would be remiss not to recognize how this approach to patient care may help mitigate medical mistrust and poor outcomes for vulnerable populations of women who are already at high risk of pregnancy complications. The concept of patient empowerment can be impacted on a systemic level, not just by patient and provider factors, but also, and perhaps most notably, by things like political context, legislation or health policy, health priorities, and a culture within a healthcare system. Social determinants of health and pregnancy. The World Health Organization defines social determinants as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These factors are primary contributors to unfair and avoidable differences in health status that we see within countries, between countries, and between populations within those countries. Here in California, in our local communities, we see all kinds of patients. Some are from a far more privileged background than others, coming from maybe more under-resourced areas. And it's important to take into consideration that a patient's road to empowerment and self-efficacy may look quite different depending on how these social determinants of socioeconomic status, physical environment, food environment, healthcare, social cohesion, and capital have impacted them. 
self-efficacy and empowerment in vulnerable populations and in dealing with health disparities can present additional challenges, but also additional opportunities to meet this need. Successful change is more likely to occur when a patient believes they can succeed. We know affirmation is one way to help patients believe in their ability to succeed. We also know that educational intervention leads to this belief, to self-efficacy. Empowerment comes from that sense of self-efficacy. So our goal here is to continue reducing the gaps in care for better overall health outcomes. And we can do that by taking the perspective of our patients, supporting their self-efficacy to empower them in their journey. Assessing health literacy is so important to make sure that our patients are prepared to take the next step in their care. Although health literacy is not dependent on socioeconomic factors, it is definitely something that needs our attention. A patient who struggles to understand what they're being told in their diagnosis or what they're being asked to do as a treatment or care regimen is simply not going to be as successful at handling both the physical and emotional impacts of that diagnosis and treatment regimen as someone who does understand what they're being told or has easy access to resources that can clarify it for them. As we talked about earlier with resources and referrals from the provider's toolkit, it's vital that providers recommend specific evidence-based sites and sources to provide accurate and up-to-date information about pregnancy and diabetes. Anyone can search the internet, but it doesn't mean the search results will yield evidence-based science. In fact, it's likely to support any misinformation they may already believe and or encourage fear instead of empowerment. So we want to get ahead of that and prevent that from happening. Over one third of the adult population in this country has limited health literacy, which is a key reason why addressing health literacy is the focus of the US Department of Health and Human Services Healthy People 2030 initiative. They've acknowledged that eliminating health disparities, achieving health equity, and attaining health literacy improves the health and well being of everyone. Some groups are more likely than others to have limited health literacy including certain racial or ethnic groups, recent refugees and immigrants, people with less than a high school degree or GED, people with incomes at or below the poverty level, and non-native speakers of English. So this national action plan to improve health literacy advises the universal precautions approach. Basically, it's asking us to assume that everyone that we come into contact with may have difficulty understanding the health information being given to them. It's better to go over something that someone already understands than risk allowing a patient to leave the appointment uninformed. Teaching back is an effective method um, to help assure that a patient is prepared to process the information that's been given to them in an appointment and take meaningful action on their own at home to care for themselves and their condition. So we already know that this is an important and effective way to ensure that the patient walks away with the knowledge from the appointment. This is always important, but when you stop to think about how crucial it is for women with gestational diabetes or pregnant women with pre-existing diabetes to fully understand what's going on, what their care requires, and how to implement the plans made in their doctor's office, it becomes that much more essential. This isn't a can that can be kicked down the road. These are timely actions that have very real positive or negative impact as a direct result of patient understanding and implementation. We have to make sure that questions are answered, information is fully understood, and the patient is prepared to self-manage between appointments. The teach back method is one way to do this that confirms that the patient understands what they need to know before leaving the appointment. This method improves information retention and accuracy. Over time, observing how teaching back impacts patients 
can help providers more easily come up with explanations and communication strategies that work for most patients or most commonly understood. The TALK acronym is a specific tool to help patients understand and act on health information. And you can utilize your motivational interviewing skills in this format as well. Using plain language while sitting eye to eye with the patient can help create a safe environment where patients feel comfortable engaging in the TALK conversation. If you have visual models that can help illustrate your teaching, that's a helpful tool for many people as well, especially those who identify as visual learners. Starting here, you can ask the patient to tell you more about their concerns. You can encourage them to ask questions about their diabetes management, pregnancy, or whatever is on their mind. This is an opportunity to provide those vetted resources and referrals to help the patient address these questions and concerns. Then you can affirm the patient's ability to act on this information to promote health. Let's look at another case study. In our second case study, we have a 33-year-old patient who's experiencing difficulty using the blood glucose meter she was given upon her gestational diabetes diagnosis. Worse still is that when she's able to get it to work, She's seeing elevated numbers outside of the range her doctor has indicated, and she's seeing this most often when she wakes up in the morning. So what's happening is she does not feel motivated to check her blood sugars because it's a cumbersome and sometimes painful process that often yields results that make her feel sad, ashamed, or confused. So utilizing the TALK acronym, her provider sat down with this patient and asked her to tell us what is going on. The patient simply said, my glucometer doesn't work. In addition to that, the doctor saw that lab work showed that her blood glucose had been out of range. So through the use of open-ended questions, the provider was able to elicit further information and questions, leading to a more fruitful conversation. Now, they're aware that not only does the patient think that the glucometer doesn't work, but also wants to know why their numbers are always high in the morning. Now the patient is able to learn more about both how to use the glucometer more accurately, consistently, and efficiently, but also some of the reasons why the numbers she's seeing have been out of range. To keep healthy, the patient and provider work together to determine that a good next step is to take the information that they've gone over in this appointment and have the patient follow up with the registered dietitian about instituting the bedtime snack in her quest for in-range fasting numbers. Patients can be shy about asking these questions that need to be answered in order for them to reach their treatment goals. So using the TALK acronym can be a helpful way to not just build rapport and create tailored patient education opportunities, but also to develop health literacy over time. Talking about the phrase, phrases around culture and how that plays in to caring for women who are dealing with diabetes and pregnancy. In the late 80s and 90s, the phrase cultural competence joined the healthcare conversation. The idea was that it would help reduce disparities and encourage optimal care to be delivered regardless of the patient's cultural background. However, cultural competency is no longer the standard, as it mistakenly implies that culture is a skill that one can master. While this phrasing has fallen out of use, we have some other contemporary principles of care that take into consideration patient culture, which we know to be vitally important in caring for patients with diabetes and pregnancy, with the knowledge that certain populations are still at a much higher risk of maternal mortality, we must take these principles into account to help close the gap. Cultural humility is one such phrase. This is the idea that a clinician approaches an appointment with humility and a sense of being humble about recognizing the limits of their knowledge of a patient's particular situation as it relates to their culture. Cultural awareness, uh, where a clinician ideally avoids generalizing assumptions and is aware of both 
their own biases and the patient's potential biases in relation to culture. Cross-cultural care, which ensures mutual understanding through patient-centered communication. And cultural respect, which centers around respectfully asking open-ended questions about patient circumstances and values when appropriate in order to deliver the best possible care. Perhaps as you're listening to this, you're thinking of a time that you yourself have experienced care positively or negatively that was impacted by your own culture or a clinician's bias. We should continue to strive towards providing empathetic care to all patients without bias as we continue to educate ourselves about the best practices in the field to reduce healthcare disparities and increase health literacy, ultimately resulting in patient empowerment and self-efficacy for patients of all cultures and backgrounds. As we approach the end of this training module, I want to emphasize what an important job you have in providing specialized care to women managing diabetes and pregnancy. Remember, you need to take care of yourself so you can continue to support these efforts in others. Your dedication to a fresh perspective through the care, education, and affirmation that you provide are imperative to your patient's overall well-being and positive outcomes in pregnancy. It has been my pleasure to provide this training. Thank you for taking the time to explore ways to empower your patients and cultivate their self-efficacy in their journey with diabetes and pregnancy. And that concludes the CDAP Sweet Success Training Module on Self-Efficacy and Patient Empowerment.